From Studio A in Las Vegas, hi, I'm uh, Joe Greer, I'm the Dean at the Roseman University College of Medicine, and we hope to bring to you something very important. This show, Cuba Pete, No Laughing Matters, about the intersection of society with health outcomes and how we should be educating our future workforce. Well, we got some work to do in medical education. Only 5% of American medical students are African American, about one third of that's in leadership positions. About 5.6% are Hispanics, and there's only four Hispanic deans in the United States of America. Three of them are in Puerto Rico. So we can say we're racist, we're xenophobic, we're sexist. 50% of physicians are women, only about 10% sit in leadership positions. That's a problem. It's a problem that's reflected in our communities. And we saw that, and we're seeing that with COVID. With the unfortunate infection rates and deaths and long-term consequences in the black and brown communities. And we're doing nothing to try and change that. We have huge vaccine hesitancies in these communities. And why should they trust us? We didn't take care of them during COVID or before COVID for that matter. And when we go into somebody's community, I'm Hispanic. If I'm in a Hispanic community, I will speak Spanish make people feel comfortable and let them know. Well, we want to change that here at Roseman. And we have a very special group here. One of the things we're doing, and this is being led by Dr. Cheryl Brewster, who will be taking over as the hostess, is a pathway. How do we get kids interested? And not only that, we're pricing kids out of college. We're throwing away talent. So we need to recruit from the very beginning when they're young and let them know what they can accomplish. And here today we have Erica Mosca, who I have had the pleasure of, of meeting and working with. She is the founder and the executive director of LIT, Leaders in Training. She has both uh, educational masters and a master's in education. One from UNLV, the other one from Harvard. She did her undergraduate at Boston University and came out here with Teachers in America, Teach for America. The, uh, we have Cassina Douglas Boone. She started an organization called Tulips about 10 years ago, wasn't it? Fantastic. That's teaching utilizing ladies to inspire positive success. She's also one of the leaders at Ty's Place, where Cheryl had organized and we had a, an event there. She uh, is also a former assemblywoman when she took over District 17 for her mentor who passed, unfortunately, Tyrone Thompson. She's also a mental health specialist, social worker. She's also a teacher, happily married, and with six children. Am I correct there? That's correct. Okay, and this is only a little bit because I don't have the time to say everything. <laughs> and we're also fortunate here to have with us today Craig Rosen. He is the Community Engagement and Professional Development Administrator for Desert Research Institute, DRI, Office of Education. He's got his uh, bachelor's in psychology from... Uh, California State University, Northridge, and his master's in urban leadership from UNLV. He's the founding director of Nevada STEAM Conference. He also has worked extensively with NASA, and he used to direct religious schools in both California and Nevada. Am I correct there? Yep, yep. And then we have the special guest. We have Trinise Crowder, Crowder and her son Jordan, who were at the event. We have Erico Rico. Eric Rico. Eddie? Just Eddie? Eric. 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 Just Eric? You took the vowel off in there? <laughs> we have Eric uh, Rico, who's a junior in high school. Yes. And, uh, and by the way, Jordan's in fifth grade, going to be a senior in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and hosting with me today, we have 
our Senior Executive Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as for The Pathway. This is a person I have worked with, with for many years. Actually, my hair was still white. <laughs> 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 but what she has taught me about community, about educating, is, or have been invaluable lessons, which I try to fit into everything that we do at the medical school. With that, thank you, Dr. Cheryl Brewster. Cheryl. It's all on me. It's my job. Well, I, once again, I would like to thank everyone for participating in one way or another, either through the partnerships that we've formed, with recruiting kids to come to this event, such as Jordan and Eric, or actually as a presenter, I think it was an amazing day. So I wanna kick off some questions and I wanna to talk to the young people that were in attendance. That would be you, Jordan. So tell me, what was your favorite session of the day? So just to recap what Dr. Greer talked about, we did an event August 14th, 2021 of this year at Ty's Place with Casina Boone helping us in collaboration to actually host it at Ty's Place. So thank you, because she actually found the venue. And it is called A Rose Grows in a Desert. And this is an opportunity for us to just give a taste of steam to young people who don't know what it's about, want to learn more about what they already know, or just are, their interest is peaked just around steam and the sciences, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And so we had that day and it was a great turnout. We had about 35 youth and we had just had a great day. And Jordan is one of those. So back to that question, Jordan, what was your favorite part of the day? I have to say that my favorite part of the day was when we got to do the VR with Mr. Craig. Okay. And we got to experience the neutral buoyancy labs in NASA and we got to wear that headset and feel like we're actually experiencing every single thing that these astronauts so you felt like have you were to in do. Space. It was the neutral buoyancy lab, so we were underwater, but Oh, okay. So see, you could see, actually feel I didn't know that. So you could actually <laughs> so you could actually feel the training and Oh see you, that's why you could I mean, look around. Like it was a three sixty experience. They explained how a lot of it worked and it was very fun. Okay, great. So you taught me some stuff today. It's because I, I didn't get to do the VR because I had others. I mean, Shayla had me doing other stuff. So anyway. Um, so what would you tell other young people such as yourself about an event like this? And should they even come? They should definitely come. Okay. It was very fun. Now, a lot of people, especially in, in my grade, they're not like, really into steam and all that but it's really fun even even though like yeah. you can learn a lot from that you could take that and apply it in everyday knowledge okay well that was the goal so i like that one word you used fun right that was our goal to make sure it was fun while you still learned eric Hi. my high schooler so you know why i picked you eric to be on this show because you were one of the more vocal youth that was there that day so i was like i gotta get eric on the show because he's <laughs> got you. a lot of he's got a lot to say so tell me about what was um something you enjoyed that day and what you would like to see in the future i really enjoyed the hands-on um experience you guys gave us because with every little thing it involved us uh, you could go from the music health where they would give us uh, wax sticks oh, okay. and that would help us in, uh, in tune our emotions with our mental health. Or you could go with the healthy part of, uh, I believe it was a smoothie. You made smoothies. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So funny story about the smoothies. <laughs> that is. We had one, every group rotated around to the smoothie station. So I had someone come to me and they were like, I didn't really like the smoothie station. I was like, but you picked the things that went in the smoothie. I didn't pick them. You put that together. And then she was like, you're right. I didn't like the smoothie I made. So she changed it. <laughs> she changed it from she didn't like the smoothie station to the, the choice that she made is what she didn't like. Accountability. Not a I love chef. it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
What should we expect in the future? What kind of things would you like to see in future events like this? In future events, I believe I'd like to see something about self-confidence. Okay. Because even with the best of health, you could be as healthy as a horse, but if you don't believe in yourself, where's the, what's that health going to do for I like you? That. I like that. I applaud that effort. So as a mom, Ms. Trinise, why was it important for Jordan to be in attendance? Well, I believe that for uh, minorities, the question is always about having a seat at the table. But you put them in a position to build their own table and they never have to look for a seat at anyone else's. So I wanted to give him an opportunity to be exposed to more so that he can make an informed decision about what it is he wants to do with his future and affect other lives ultimately, you know, with positive change. Right. So we can expect Jordan F. to join. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He'll be there. Love it. Love it. Love it. And... Mr. Craig, as Jordan calls you. Yes. Thank you so much for being presenter. Obviously, you were actually one of the top choices that the youth picked when we looked at our evaluation. So kudos to you. Well, very happy to Everyone be part of Everyone loved this. the VR room. So Who doesn't love VR, who right? Who doesn't? Especially me, because I didn't even know what you were doing in there. Isn't that <laughs> awful? So why did you volunteer? Why is this important for, for us to do these kinds of events? So the Desert Research Institute is really invested in STEM and STEAM education. Uh, we are amongst the leaders in the state uh, really promoting this and, and doing that work uh, in the classrooms and, uh, and across the state. Um, it's the path to ending poverty. If we can get our young people to uh, embrace STEM and STEAM, um, there are thousands of jobs open today in those mm -hmm. fields. So um, we just have to, as you said, aspire, right? G give that aspiration, give the exposure and make STEM and STEAM fun. So I'm really glad that Jordan had fun doing it, right? Make, yeah. make it fun, give that introduction and whet their appetite so that they will um, pursue a career yeah. uh, in one of these areas. Yeah, um, exactly. That's so, so needed. Yeah. And you and I have spoken about this. We are very much on one accord with understanding that it doesn't just impact the individual that goes through these programs. It can impact entire family or household and then therefore letting out to the community and, and changing a trajectory for not just that young person, but for their family as a whole. So creating a uh, generational wealth is, is something that is sorely lacking in these communities. And this is one way that we can hope to uh, allow them to attain some of those goals and dreams that the, the American dream, so to speak, right? Right, and it starts with exposure. Yeah. I mean, it really does. And if you, if you look at our senior faculty, we're incredibly diverse. The 50% uh, uh, is African-American. I'm Hispanic. We have three now that are foreign-born. Two first-generation college, both of them with PhDs, one with a PhD and an MD. And myself and uh, the other Dr. Brewster were both children of first generation uh, college. Yeah. So the, the, the impact that you make as you go along with that is huge. Yeah, changing well, that trajectory. You know, it, sa it, it says that um, if, if you can show a diverse teacher, right? Right. Then the students will see themselves in that profession yep. as well, so. And we're, we're a medical school that is not community engaged. We're community dependent. Yeah. So we'll have interdisciplinary teams that actually visits the households for four years. And in our last institution, because we were so diverse, all of a sudden parents started saying, hey, that student looks like me or has the same accent I do. Maybe my kid can be a doctor or a nurse or mm -hmm. a pharmacist or a dental student yeah. or a dentist. And then they asked the students, would you tutor us? And of course the medical student said yes. And then we explained to them that they have 12 week long surgical rotations, which <laughs> is not gonna let them tutor. So to, te to teach the student also that they went to the School of Education and got st uh, education students to tutor them. It's yeah, cool. it's important. So talk about that a little bit, um, Christina. Um, the importance of getting students that are traditionally underrepresented in these fields and how we can make a difference in the community here in Las Vegas. I think everybody um, pretty much started the conversation with being able to have a seat at the table and the exposure. One of the things that um, I can say is that, you know, we don't tap into the imagination of young people like we used to. Um, you know, we don't 
when a child says they want to be a police officer, a firefighter, or a doctor, or a nurse, we don't take that seed and cultivate it. And I think the follow through is very important. A, a program like Aspire, um, being able to capture young people when they're in middle school and high school who have that sense of already knowing what they want to want to be, being able to connect them with tutors and mentors. Um, I think it's very important that we understand that there, a lot of the spaces that our young people come from, that exposure is not there. Yeah. And so sometimes um, our young people, they are put in a position where they have to be the adult in the household. And mm -hmm. the being the adult in the household or even the adult in the community, in their community spaces, um, puts them at a disadvantage. So having a program where you're going to be able to tap into all of the resources from, you know, STEAM, STEM, and, you know, even knowing that, like like Jordan said, that, that it's fun. And, you know, it hurts me to think that when he said other fifth graders like him, they don't think that this is fun because somewhere that fifth grade, that magic piece, the piece of who they are has been lost. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would like to see, you know, community spaces like this and partners collaborate to be able to to create environments and spaces where young people can come and see exactly what we did that day to feel like what it feels like to be underwater. We know they know how to be under pressure, but we want them to feel Ooh, how, like how it feels to be under, like that. under underwater and kind of like see the possibilities. Yes, yes. So I'm saving you for last, Miss Erica, because, I, you know, kudos to Erica, because Erica... Erica, I'm going to love on Erica for a second here. Let me just give me a minute to love on, on Erica Mosca because I met Erica and Erica embraced Roseman. She embraced us as a team. She helped. She introduced me to a lot of people. She opened up a lot of doorways for us being a new team from Miami. She trusted us which is, you know, sometimes not easy to, to gain people's trust in the community. Especially because, since we're from Miami. Yeah, well, not because of that, Joe. <laughs> Miami has nothing to do with it. It has all to do with academics, yes. right? A lot of times there are, uh, universities can come into a community and don't know how to develop trust and build that trust and maintain that trust. And so Erica was just open and, you know, we had an honest conversation about all right, you know, don't don't come in here and tell me you're going to do something and don't do it because she was like, I'm, I will come for you. And I was like, I'm scared, Miss Erica. Talk to me about the importance of engaging with communities, particularly communities that are under-resourced, underserved, and the young people that come from those communities because your organization works with young people through college and beyond, right? And so we felt, I felt like we were such a good match that I was just like, I'm in love with Erica. She can never leave. Well, that's all too nice, but thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you, Dr. Brewster. Oh, thank you. But I think it's really everything that we've heard here, I think is just so inspir inspirational. I think there are a couple of things when we say community dependent, we know that we're not just coming into the community to solve a problem or that we know better. And I think something about this event and with Roseman is that when I get to meet leadership that looks like me, that comes from the community as well, that has had similar experiences, then we know that you're gonna get it. You're right. not just gonna fly by, take the pictures to say that you were there mm -hmm. on social media. You actually follow up, get to know the youth, wanna know what's happening with them next so that they can, like Ms. Trinise said, build their own table. And we need community partners. It, think about it's a medical school. So our students have to, go to college, and then go to a medical school, you're so many years removed, but you're willing to be in the community now really shows the example that you want this community to be the leaders for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. So, we, w we want what happens in Vegas not to stay in Vegas. We want it to go all over the world. We and the work that you the guys doctors, are doing. Though, here. We what? do want to keep the doctors here. Yes. Well, the, 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 the other advantage to that is when you go for first generation college students, because what I'd love to see them is we'd love to educate them at Rosen. I'd love for them to train at the top centers in the country, but first generation college comes home. And then, because they're the first ones that are able to build wealth, they're the first ones that are going to come back and help take care of their family. So you do come back. Yeah, good. And, the, and that's because. 
the other system hasn't been working. Right. Definitely so not. how do you support them when they do come back? Well, when they come back, they're already uh, professionals. Right. But even though you're a professional, because remember, we, you know, now you have gone away and, and now you're the trust factor is there because now you're one of them, you know. Well, the, the same way that we do it. You pound the pavement. You build trust. OK. You, you, nobody's going to trust us just because I say, hi, I'm a doctor, you know, or I play one on television. It doesn't it it doesn't work that way. Right. And the most essential aspect of what Cheryl is doing, what I do as a physician is the trust that a patient has with you. Well, that trust has to be expanded to the community. And then we also need to know our place in society. The doctors are not at the top of the heap all the time, nor should we be. And so we need to train a doctor that's compassionate, a doctor that's humble, a doctor that's empathetic. Things that we have lost in our profession. Yes. And when we get to the very top, this was something that was taught to me in Hispanic leadership 35 years ago was, Remember what it's like to be made to be felt like a minority, so you never, ever make anybody feel that way again. Yeah, that's a good point. Mr. Nice, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, we've been sitting here having a conversation, and, you know, I think it's important, you know, I'm a mom, you're a mom, and, and, and we all want what's best for our young people. Um, but, you know, I think this is... This is bigger than just us being moms, right? This Absolutely. Is, this is about building community so that, you know, Jordan has friends that look like him interested in the same things that he's interested in, right? right? And it's not, you know, no no shade on, you know, sports, but no, there's other things, right? So talk a little bit about your thoughts about that. Well, referring to him in particular, uh, as a child, he's always been interested in engineering from before he could walk fully. He was um, a tinkerer, if you will. And, um, you know, what he wanted for his birthdays, uh, his second birthday, he has to go to space camp on his second. And I'm like, um, how do you even know what that is? <laughs> um, and so like me as an educator myself, I spend a time pouring into children like him because I understand what it means to have a lack of that in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, for him, you know, he's blessed that I saw that in him and I was able to pour into him in the ways that mattered to him. Not what I wanted him to do, but what I saw in him already. And so as an educator and, and as a woman who happens to be a black woman, um, it's important for me to show my students someone that looks like them that is doing things. I travel, I perform, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the community and I want them. A teacher asked me today, uh, Ms. Crowder, would you mind if I brought my daughter down to see your hair? And I said, uh, absolutely. She said, well, her hair looks just like yours and she doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. So I'd like for her to see someone who's, and I said, absolutely, please do. And so it's not just about the hair. It's not just about dressing as a professional. It's about having the mindset that allows right. you to reach out to other people and spark the thing in them that makes them want to keep pushing. Nice, yes. And I start with my baby right here. Yeah. And the other thing is on the flip side of that, so you have parents that are engaged mm -hmm. and you have parents that are not as engaged. Mm -hmm. But how do we get parents to understand this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, right? How do we relay that message that I understand that they might be helping you with pay the rent or pay some bills, but you have to allow them to pursue some of their dreams and some of their goals. And how do we get our parents to really understand that this is something for the future, not for the here and now. I think um, how Aspire um, had the parents um, at the event, they had a, a space for the parents to come and get information. And like you, you were saying, um, being able to spark that interest. And I think if parents have this, if, you know, we're going to teach them to build their own table, but also make sure that we have a side menu for the parents um, so they can eat as well. Because, you know, the kids are eating from the kids' table. We want them to be able to have the, you know, the caviar of the conversation, if you will. Right. And so I think parents um, 
nowadays, and and I can say the parents who I've dealt with, parents of color, um, they feel intimidated. And so um, not to Mm. say that you have to water it down or dumb it down or anything like that, but make them feel as if they have, like what you're saying to them, you're going to invest and pour into their child and you want them to know that you know, thank you for trusting me with your child the same way that parent trusted you to to be the, you know, to be the light for their child. Um, but to, to 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 make them feel like this is our 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 child. Like we're right. I'm here to do it with you. And we as a community, um, as you said, I know what it's like to be uh, in this position or, you know, I come from this background. And like the both of you just said, first generation, you know, um, there's a story behind that. So you have there has to be a connection when you're having the caviar conversation with the parents to kind of let them know that we're in this together. And what can we do to help support you? Because, you know, STEM is I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a mathematical genius. Um, math is not my strong suit. Um, that's why I'm fat, because I can't count calories, okay? I just want you to know. So uh, math is not my thing. But again, if I know that I can, I have a doctor or I have a, uh, I have a teacher, you know, that I, who has poured into my child and my child needs help and I'm going to say to this person, hey, my baby needs help. Can you help him? And I'm not going to be a, afraid to ask or ashamed to ask because you've already created a pathway for us to connect just by having a uh, rose in the gro- a rose grows in the in desert, the desert. <laughs> e- a rose grows in the desert event where parents are a part of the conversation mm. and also give parents a chance to get their hands dirty and get in there and get in and put those things so they can see it for themselves as mm. well and and also understand if your parents don't have formal education they could be extremely intimidated yes Right. By going into an educational institution. And so we have to make everybody feel comfortable. That's the humility aspect of it. And I would also add to the more, uh, like Ms. Casino said, that we can be assets-based. You know, my, my dad has a GED, but they work two jobs to put a roof over my head. And so many of our mm-hmm. parents at Leaders in Training, they're doing what society has told them to do, provide, right. make sure there's stability. And when we say that and say thank you, we know it's not... We know that systemic racism and structural inequity is real and you're facing it and you still made sure your student was at this event. Thank you. Right. And I think the more we can give them that honor that they're and they weren't offered this usually too, like you were saying in school. So why would they trust us? So the more we can honor them and say, hey, it's really you. It's your reason that your kid is here and thank them. I think they'll will build that trust. Mm -hmm. And also, if I may briefly, um, It's also about understanding that their child is their priority, Mm -hmm. but they have competing priorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for someone who is in thrive mode, they have the time to point out cars and colors on the drive. Right. For someone who is in survival mode, they're happy that their child is occupied while they're trying to figure out how to pay the next bill. And so it it is understanding the position that they're in making them understand that you get it and providing them additional community resources that take something off their plate that allows for them to allow their child to move a bit more freely in a way that will ultimately support the family as a whole. Nice. And that's the importance of when we train our medical students that they go into households. And the medical student with the interdisciplinary team is never allowed to ask, how do you feel? Mm. They ask, what is your most urgent need? Mm -hmm. Mm. So they have a perspective of how other people's lives are. And they understand that when they're with a patient, that it wasn't that they didn't want to take their medications because they couldn't afford it. Yeah, right. Well, you know. Yeah. What were you going to say, Craig? I felt like you. Oh, I was going to say that um, you know parents are our children's primary educators, and it gets lost sometimes because the children's education creeps up ahead of the parents at around fifth grade yes. for some, right? From I know from math, right? Yes. Uh, fifth grade math, we had tears uh, d- doing that with my daughter. But um, if we can give the, I always say that, that like the kids shouldn't be going to school, it's the parents because the parents are the primary educators of their kids, right? They're with them the longest. Mm-hmm. Um, so we should do more parent education. Yeah, exactly. I agree. I agree. Anything, you want to say anything? Any closing words? Uh, I, I would like to say that it's, Ever since I was old enough to, not old enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had the surroundings uh-huh. to work in the way that I wanted to work. Mm-hmm. The way my mom, my parents 
plural, gave me the hands-on environment that I needed. And I feel like a, a lot of these people just in general need to understand that it's not the kids that you have. It's not how old they are, how, what they need to know at this certain age. It's how you teach them. Okay. I like that. I like that. It's how you teach them and how we educate them. I like it. Eric? Well, Dr. Uh, Greer. Do you have anything to say? Oh, yes, um, Eric, please. I, th I thought your point of confidence was extremely, extremely important. Yeah. Um, as you guys were saying, parents are their primary educator, but at the same time, there's times and points where like a parent is stressed and sometimes it goes to the child as well, mm -hmm. which makes them stress. And since it's like a parent and a child's bond is so deep that if a parent is worried, the child is twice as worried for the parent, yeah. wanting them to be as happy and trying their best. So, uh, what was I gonna say? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, but the parents, it's important <laughs> okay, that yeah. the parents under yeah, get, get I, that appreciation as well. Yeah. Not just about the kids, but also making sure that we, we love on the parents as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So from Studio A, you're listening to one of the most important conversations you can hear about the future of our society. How do we make it right? How are we led by social justice? And the importance of not just being a child, the importance of how you parent, and the examples that you give for your kids. So from Studio A in Las Vegas, join us and let's save the world. When I play the maracas, I go chick chicky boom, chick chicky boom. 